I think that the nature of the woke problem that we face is that communism has adapted to uh, Western values. It's found the entry points. It's not bourgeois versus proletariat. It's not economic entry points that actually worked in successful um, market-based economies. It turns out that it was it's cultural points. It's um, immigration. It's race. It's sexuality. It's just sex with um, the feminist stuff. And so it found that its way in was actually going to be through cultural politics, overwhelmingly, uh, identity politics. James Lindsay, welcome to Creed and Culture. How are you doing today? I'm all right. Thank you. Good to hear it. James, I saw an interview in which you said you give hundreds of talks a year. And I, I believe from memory you take you know, a couple hundred flights a year as a result. Is that correct? Well, the couple hundred flights is correct, as in I've actually counted. I don't know how many talks I give, but we could probably – guess that uh, since you have to fly each direction, uh, it's somewhat less than a couple hundred. But I probably do give close to 100 public lectures a year right now. And I did hit just over 200 flights last year, 175 the year before. So yeah, so all these lines on the map drawn behind me, these black lines are, are actually the flight routes that, well, actually, they're just straight lines connecting the cities, but um, all the different flights I've taken. Uh, each unique one is is drawn on the map. Nice, nice. And where do you find yourself at the moment? Where are you speaking to I'm us? I'm at from? home. I'm in East Tennessee right now, at home, uh, which is nice because um, I can get some other. I can there. There's work I can do when I'm home, and there's work that I cannot do when I'm home. And so I'm getting a lot more of the things I can do while I'm here done. I don't travel with my sound equipment, for example. So anything that's right that's audio, I have to do while I'm here. Yeah. Yes, James's site, uh, his podcast is called New Discourses. Uh, and I think it's audio only, isn't that right? Yeah, so far, um, I usually am in exactly the situation that you see me here, but a little more disheveled. And um, I don't feel like me looking awkwardly around and reading off of a screen, uh, you know, is a very good look for, for a podcast. People request video, but... Um, no, it's audio only. So if you go on uh, on YouTube or Rumble and watch it, you will see some kind of a video, you know, picture that occupies the screen for the entirety and you just hear my voice, which other people tell me some people want to see me, but other people actually appreciate it because then they have no uh, compulsion to sit and watch and will be more yeah. likely to get up and with the headphones and in and, and, and do something else. Go to the gym or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, you're very busy, so we really appreciate you joining us and uh, look forward to the discussion. Now, you shot to fame. Uh, your, your background in academia, your PhD in mathematics, but then you shot to fame through the academic hoax. Do you want to tell us briefly about that? Yeah, I mean, pretty brief. Uh, it is super relevant again now. We're seeing these academic scandals coming up uh, at Harvard with plagiarism. Uh, for example, that's maybe the most famous one, not just the president, but also one of their diversity deans now has been shown to have been a plagiarist. I think more of that will be surfacing. But we're also seeing people starting to ask questions about the quality of academic work that is not necessarily plagiarized. The stuff that's making it through the gate regardless. And that's what we tried to shine a light on five years ago, almost, I guess, five and a half years ago, maybe six. Um, it was 17 and 18 that we did this. And um, myself with your friend, Peter Bergoshin, our, our mutual friend, and Helen Pluckrose, who's over there on your island, uh, set forth to write 20 papers. We had a trial balloon before that, so 21 papers total that uh, meant to expose that the uh, quality of, of scholarship that you could get through in what we were calling at the time the theoretical humanities subjects like gender studies and race studies and you know all of ethnic studies and all of that sort of stuff that that you could get basically anything you wanted through as long as you flattered their biases and wrote it in an attendant academic fashion that that respected the literature and so this did get us kind of shot to fame. It was front page of the New York Times. It made the print editions mm. of over 400 newspapers worldwide uh, at the fall of 2018 when it came public. And, you know, we got on every show 
that exists, I think, for about a year. Uh, it, was, it was a very, very busy time doing interviews. Uh, so it did really get us some attention. But I think that we were very successful because of those 20 papers of, that are part of the, the, not the trial balloon, but the core 20 papers that we wrote, seven of, seven of them were fully accepted for publication by mm -hmm. esteemed academic journals. What a lot of people don't know is that publication process is very slow. They don't accept it and publish it the next day. It sometimes takes a year. It sometimes takes many months. Sometimes it's just a few weeks, but it's very rarely faster than several weeks. And so we actually had four of them of the seven that got accepted. Four actually got published in print. And um, one of those won an, an award for excellence and scholarship in the field. And that field was feminist geography. And that paper, of course, was the one, the famous one about the dog park, um, which is maybe the most famous of, of our articles where we insisted that you can learn something about rape culture by watching how people react to dogs um, humping one another at the dog park. And that the conclusion that from what we drew is, of course, that there's rape culture everywhere, even among dogs. And so we can control rape culture if we train men the way that we train dogs using leashes and obedience manuals and such. Uh, to to get men under control. And so that paper won an award for excellence in scholarship, despite being one of the most ridiculous things that's probably been ever been written. Uh, and so the, yeah. the point was, plagiarism or not, what's getting through in many disciplines in academia is guided more by ideology than it is by quality. It's not being properly vetted or checked. Um, and I don't know what proportion of the papers uh, that have been published in the last few decades are untrustworthy, but I would suspect it's a very high proportion of the papers are untrustworthy. Wow. And there was one with the title something about conceptual penis. That was the trial Minus balloon, yeah. Off. So the first paper Peter and I wrote before Helen got involved with us uh, working on it was called The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct. And so in that paper, we argued that penises are best thought of otherwise than as anatomical reproductive organs. It would be better to think of them instead as a social construct that causes most of the problems in society, especially climate change. And so we were <laughs> extremely gratuitous. You know, it was very kind of, um, you know, teenage boy humor, uh, just really <laughs> over the top descriptions of 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 penis did jokes. that one get published that one that's the answer to your question is technically yes but in the meaning of things no so we we submitted that to a gender studies journal specifically a masculinity journal that's called norma which is an acronym and i forget what it stands for um sure. and they did not accept it. They did not take it. And then what happened next is genuinely an academic scandal that should have gotten attention, but we were too excited um, about what happened. And we blame gender studies rather than the true academic scandal we accidentally uncovered. And so what happened was that journal, which was a Taylor and Francis journal, that's the publishing brand, uh, said, well, we don't want it, but we'll forward it to our sister journal, which is called Cogent Social Sciences. They'll be interested in it. And we'll forward it for you. You don't have to go submit it. We're not recommending you go. We'll forward the paper to our sister journal uh, under the Taylor and Francis imprint if you want. And I said, OK, so they forwarded it to this journal. But that journal is a pay to publish journal. And so they wanted it was a discount. So normally it's thirteen hundred dollars at the time and they'll publish the paper. And they asked us it was on a discount for whatever reason. It was six hundred fifty dollars. But then they forgot to charge us. And they just published the paper anyway, and then, you know, kind of embarrassed the next morning, asked, oh, my gosh, we forgot to charge you. Please submit your payment. And we said no, because we were, you know, we got through what we wanted to get through. But it turns out that this, mm. this, those kinds of journals are called predatory journals. And what they do is they'll take papers and publish them uh, for money. And so then out in the literature mm. that looks academic and maybe it can fool some people oh, here and there, yes. you can get virtually anything published in those kinds of journals by paying for them to publish it. 
It's a little murky mm. because there are actually many scientific journals do actually require you to pay for your own publication. Um, that's a standard practice in the science and it's sciences mm. and it's not shady. But this practice is very shady because our paper was of, of absolutely abysmal quality. So what we had actually uncovered was that Taylor and Francis, as an academic publisher, was willing to take substandard papers and funnel them through legitimate journals to illegitimate journals in order to, to make a profit, which is academic malpractice for certain. And mm -hmm. um, we actually uncovered that, but we said, oh, a gender studies paper got accepted and it's this ridiculous thing. And of course, it got a lot of press and it got a lot of pushback because the, the nature of that journal uh, was very obvious to academics. And so we um, ended up in this murky situation of did we prove a point or did we not? And it turns out that uh, that one friend and one enemy both wrote reviews of the stunt, the trial balloon, the, the conceptual penis, and they the, both offered us guidance. If James and Peter had wished to prove their point, here's what they would have had to do instead. And they gave us a list. So that's where the other project, the other 20 papers came from. Peter and I got on the phone and said, well, they gave us a map. Let's follow it. Let's do those things and see what they say. And we're not, we don't usually put money on a lot of stuff, but Peter, I mean, I wasn't going to take his bet because I didn't disagree with him, but Peter uh, immediately framed it in a bet. He was like, I bet you a hundred dollars right now that if we do A, B, C, D, exactly like they said, and we succeed, they won't change their minds. And I, of course, I'm not going to bet against him because I knew that, like, I, I agreed that our enemies were not going to change their minds. They just wanted us to be wrong. Mm. They didn't, they didn't have actual principles guiding them. Uh, but then we were very successful and Peter was right. Uh, the person who was our friend that gave us a roadmap, of course, said we showed a lot more. The person who was actually just an enemy of ours turned around and, uh, I think accused us of being, um, what did he say? He said that we had really malevolent intentions and uh, I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing that Peter was motivated by vengeance and like all of these negative things as if that proves or disproves anything about what happened. Mm. Well, thanks so much. I mean, you've explained that probably a couple of hundred times in the last few years. So thank you again. And it, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I know I am writing for a, or popular audience. I only ever published one academic journal, but it was really tough. You know, you had to go through so many uh, drafts and redrafts. That was in sort of theology or philosophy. And what you're showing is that in, in these particular fields, the standards are pretty low as as long as you've got the right conclusion. Yeah. So, so you'll appreciate it, yeah, 20 yeah. papers in a calendar year. Yeah, right. 20. Right. When I, most academics in, in other fields maybe write, yeah, a couple. So, well, so let's think about society. Let's think about what's going on at the moment. We Two episodes ago, we had two guys on debating whether we should resist the DEI initiatives. So that's obviously taken off because of, in part, the, the fuss around the resignation of uh, Claudine Gay, president of Harvard University. So just, again, briefly, because we, we could spend hours on this, but so what's the nature, do you think, of this kind of woke problem that we're facing in society? I have a pretty, I mean, I think it's not that radical to suggest and can back it up and have backed it up in many places. Not least, I backed it up in the EU Parliament um, last March, so about a year ago. Uh, I think that the nature of the woke problem that we face is that communism has adapted to uh, Western values. It's found the entry points. It's not bourgeois versus proletariat. It's not economic mm -hmm. entry points that actually worked in successful um, market-based economies. It turns out that it was it's cultural points. It's um, immigration. It's race. It's sexuality. It's just sex with um, feminist stuff. And so it found that its way in was actually going to be through cultural politics, overwhelmingly uh, identity politics. And a lot of people misunderstand what identity politics is. They hear the words identity politics. They think of the civil rights movement. They're picturing Martin Luther King. They're thinking of the marches in the 1960s. But the phrase identity politics specifically used never was applied in the 1960s. It was coined in 1977. 
much later, and it was coined in the manifesto of a very radical Marxist group that was called the Combahee River Collective. The Combahee River Collective was a group, It's a, this is the most tedious description you have to give, but you have to understand who these people were. They were, in their own description, Marxist, lesbian, black feminists. And so you had people who were explicitly Marxist. They were following in the line of people like Angela Davis, who famously said the Communist Party USA was too conservative for her, who was the PhD student of Herbert Marcuse, who was the most famous neo-Marxist of the 1950s and 60s and 70s in the United States, uh, having come from Germany originally. It was following in that line in a branch of thought called black feminism that doesn't describe people, that describes a school of thought, which is that feminism as a more universal movement for women neglects the pieces that are relevant to black women specifically, and that uh, particularly black nationalism or black liberationism ignore the issues of women. And in fact, those movements were overwhelmingly sexist, I mean, on a pretty unambiguous scale. And so they created this other school of thought, which was called black feminism, that targeted both. It accused black nationalism of being sexist and it accused feminism of being racist. Mm -hmm. This is the birthplace of intersectionality. Intersectionality. That's right. And so it turns out that um, Kimberly Crenshaw is credited with creating intersectionality because she gave it its name. But when she gave it its name, she was citing Angela Davis and she was talking about and she actually does reference the Combahee River Collective at different points, not in that specific paper. And the model was laid out specifically in that manifesto, which is the first recorded use of the term identity politics. But where they got it wasn't just from Marcusa and from uh, Angela Davis. They're quite explicit. There's a book by a woman named uh, Charlene Carruthers that came out a couple of years ago called Unapologetic, where they explain that these women. And in that movement more broadly of black feminism and, in fact, black nationalism were inspired by the thought of Mao Zedong, who also employed an identity politics model to split China apart. And so his model was, you know, basically workers and peasants on the one side as as identity categories and then, you know, wealthy farmers and Hmm. uh, landlords, but then counter revolutionaries and bad elements or bad influences, he called them, and right wingers on the other side. And then he had his revolutionary identities that were the vanguard of the movement, revolutionary soldiers and leaders and intellectuals and so on that had bought into the Maoist system and they were on the good side with the laborers and the peasants. And so you, cre- he created an identity politics system where all of these different forms of, whether of, of economic oppression, first it was, you know, uh, laborers and peasants against landlords and farmers. So you have the mm-hmm. worker, worker peasant Alliance on the one side. And then on the other side, you have their, their bourgeois enemies. And it turns out that that created the first kind of taste of this, two forms of oppression that are intrinsically linked but different, peasants and workers. The Combahee River Collective Mm. borrowed this thought and expanded it to race and sex and then eventually Mm. sexuality. They were all, in the Combahee River Collective, they were openly all lesbians. Um, So race, sex, and sexuality became the basis for a new identity politics that they fused onto economic class and immigrant status. If you actually read the original papers from Kimberly Crenshaw, she's already in the 1989, 1991, talking about the relevance of immigration to the complexities of race and sex. So a third dimension getting in, in, incorporated in its immigration. Are we going to set up centers, for example, to be able to um, translate for immigrants who are also people of color? That's a huge issue for her. And then she's you know, giving, as they always do, sob stories of where that wasn't available and some terrible outcome happened and something very bad. So, of course, you have to feel emotionally attached to the fact that we have to do something to solve this problem. And so there you end up just with those two groups, the Combi River Collective and, and then Kimberly Crenshaw herself specifically. You see that the intersectionality of race, sex, sexuality and immigration status or national status national citizen status are all already being incorporated. And we're talking decades ago. So identity politics to me is a Mm -hmm. Western adaptation of Marxism and Maoism so that it can infect Western societies because the economic stuff didn't work. 
you could make mm. people you can make renters hate their landlords but you can also you can't convince them that it's impossible for them to become a landlord too if they want to all they have to do is get their mm. their act together earn enough money set it aside and buy their own first property that has you know one unit and then they can become a landlord and make that money if they want to as well economic arguments mm. never particularly took off in the west so they went in through mm. identity politics fascinating so what we do is we take each one of us, and we look at our our race, our sexuality, our gender, our sort of immigration status, our disabilities, et cetera, put all those together, and then we'd we then stack ourselves in terms of either oppressor at the top or oppressed on the bottom. And depending on how all those fit together, you're gonna end up and if you're towards the, the top, then then the idea is there's gonna be there's gonna need to be a leveling that that takes place is that that's sort of roughly the idea that we're working with no, here. That's right. That's exactly right. Is it's, yeah. to, it's to call, it's to generate what Stalin actually called actual equality. I can't do the Russian, so I apologize, but it translates as as real or actual equality, which is the word that we use the word equity for that today. Um, so Stalin believed, and Mao picked up uh, and did it differently. Stalin believed that it, when they solved the economic inequality problem in Soviet Union, that they would move on to to creating actual equality. So they were going to bulldoze all ethnic differences particularly. So if you actually read Stalin, he's very clear in words that he uses, if you translate them from the Russian, are very clear today. Actual equality or equity is one of the goals that needs to be achieved through something called indigenization. So you have to start focusing on the indigenous peoples and and bringing them to prominence. Mm. But of course, only the people who agree with Stalin count in any of the beneficial categories. Stalin was pretty crude with how he did it, and it was not very effective. Mm. And he thought it had to proceed in very discrete stages, economic first, then these other issues. Mao did it all at once. Mao didn't care. Mao was pushing ideas about Han chauvinism. So the Han race being chauvinistic, or it's the equivalent of white supremacy in critical race theory. And boxing out the racial minorities, he was working that lever, the cultural levers. At the same time, he was working his economic levers and the, the worker peasant alliance levers. So he was doing a cultural revolution and an economic revolution at the same time. But the model was Stalin's. He just borrowed Stalin's ideas and actually figured out how to operationalize them where Stalin could not. Um, and then the Americans, if you actually go back and read, I've been doing research on this um, for the past, I don't know, several months. If you go back and read these 60s and 70s and sometimes even 80s radicals in the United States that were forming the ideas that became woke, they very frequently, and they're not all U.S., I should say, some of them are South American, some of them are European, mm. they're surprisingly frank about the fact that they're deriving their ideas from China, from Mao. Um, mm. For example, the the education theorist Paulo Freire, um, who de designed what's called critical pedagogy, which is what they're doing to our mm. kids in schools all throughout the West to brainwash them, um, says explicitly in his magnum opus, his magnum opus is called Pedagogy of the Oppressed on in the middle of the first chapter. In the edition I have, it's on page 46. I've cited it so often I now know uh, what page it's on. But uh, he says explicitly, this is the method that we have, blah, blah, blah. And it has a footnote. And the footnote says this is the method that's used in Mao's Chinese Cultural Revolution. Okay, so you're immersed in this every day. Um, but I imagine, let's just step back a second. Imagine for our listeners and viewers, they're hearing Stalin and they're hearing Mao. And they're thinking tens of millions of deaths mm -hmm. in the 20th century. And then your thesis is, and it's not j just yours. I mean, I hear quite a lot of people putting forward uh, some we've had on this podcast talking about this sort of oppressor versus oppressed um, paradigm. Your thesis is that that same revolution is in a way seeping in or taking over Western culture just in a slightly different guise. It's not talking about economics. It's talking about race, sexuality, gender, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's huge. It's big, yeah. And I think <laughs> that the, the tens of millions of deaths of the 20th century is a technology limitation that we're not going to face. And I actually predict the deaths of this, if it's able to be fully implemented, to be measured in the billions uh, with a B. Uh, so um, a significant fraction of the world population uh, are in, in tremendous danger from what we think is this cutesy woke movement and people running around in rainbow flags and yelling about about race with 
the Marxist fist raised as they yell about it. Look how often the Marxist fist, that's not like just some random fist. That's not the fist of resistance. That is the Marxist fist. That's literally a communist yeah. symbol. Um, and it's, it's on everything. It's in rainbows. It's in black and white for the BLM. It's in black and yellow for BLM. It's everywhere. And so um, I think that people should really take this thesis very seriously. I encourage them to go listen to how I explained this evolution of the ideology at the EU parliament. I also encourage them in, in Britain in particular, the immigration thing is now hitting a crisis point. And I think that that's not a terribly controversial thing to say. I encourage them to go read this for themselves, draw your own conclusions. Uh, I would tell you that the story of immigration in Europe and in the United Kingdom over the past 50 years, but in particular in more recent last couple of decades, is mapped out for you in the introduction or the foreword to a book called The Wretched of the Earth. The Wretched of the Earth was written by Franz Fanon, who was an extraordinarily radical and in fact a violently radical post-colonialist. He's kind of considered the father of post-colonial thought. He was an avowed Marxist. This isn't in question. It's very clear. He believed that uh, that that decolonization, as he called it, is always intrinsically a violent process. The entire first chapter of the book, The Wretched of the Earth, is called Concerning Violence. And the first sentence says it's always violent. And uh, whatever you want to call it, decolonization is always a violent process. That's how he starts the book. And it's a actual ritual rebirth in Fanon's characterization for the colonized to murder their colonizers. And this is quite explicit, but that's not the point. This Marxist book on the colonial circumstance, which was written by a French psychotherapist that's a Marxist who is originally from Martinique, uh, Franz Fanon, has a foreword or a preface that was written by uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who was also, some people say he was a post-Marxist. This is splitting hairs. He had Marxist sensibilities about him. He supported Marxist ideas throughout his life. He's a very famous, you know, he's famous for being an existentialist, but it's undeniable that he was also a Marxist uh, in the very French style. Well, you should read his foreword, which is a letter to Europe concerning colonization, because I think it's not even a controversial thesis. If you spend time to read it, it'll take you a couple hours. It's difficult writing. It's not a controversial thesis on having read it, that that's the roadmap for Europe regarding immigration. His argument is that these people deserve to come back and take Europe, that they deserve to do so violently, that it is a necessary thing to recover their person, to bring violence to Europe. And he suggests that if the Europeans lay down and give it away, they might avoid the violence. That's the roadmap that's given away. And this forward to the wretched of the earth, which is written by a Marxist, is a forward to a Marxist book about decolonization. I think in better than any other thing written in print, all apologies to Douglas Murray, is the best explanation of what he called the strange death of Europe that I've ever read, because I think it's a roadmap. Hmm. So years ago, you've spoken about how... In your view, th this um, revolution could lead to the deaths of billions. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago when Kathy Newman had that interview with Jordan Peterson, and he said, "You know, we're this is the same ideology, and we're going in the same uh, direction." She obviously laughed at that. She, she said, "We're discussing pronouns, all right? How how can that possibly have anything to do with Stalin and Mao?" And I think a lot of people. Um, even people at the time who who sympathized with with Peterson's concerns about um, free speech, they were still like, okay, <laughs> well, Peterson, that's, that's gone a bit too far. But you know, things have advanced. So, but it is still you can see how for listeners of yours, it's still going to be quite a leap from pride flags to like deaths of billions. Now, you've just given the, the example of of immigration, and you've given that in detail, which is very helpful. Can you flesh that out a little bit more? What what that I, I know we're already seeing uh, damage to people's lives in terms of detransitioners. Yeah, sure. So people, I just find it heartbreaking. So, I've watched a bunch of these videos of these children who have detransitioned. They've so they've 
had their breast removed yeah. and then come to regret it, etc. But how how do we really see that so, kind of damage? That yeah, harm? people don't. Yeah. I, I'll talk about the the damage and harm if you want, but let me talk about totalitarianism first because people don't mm. understand. To, we we're, we live in the free West. We've been extraordinarily blessed. We don't know what totalitarianism looks like because mm. we've never lived under it. So imagine, I want to give you a hypothetical situation. I want you to imagine, let's say, we'll use Canada because everybody knows Canada is now, you know, basically a communist country. Let's say that Justin Trudeau comes out tomorrow and Justin Trudeau says what I need. We, he says there's an enormous pest problem in Canada. It's threatening, you know, our well-being. And in particular, the flies, the flies are coming up out of the bogs or whatever they're coming up out of because of climate change. The weather is warmed up and these flies are proliferating. We have so many flies in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so what I need is for every Canadian to do their part. I need every Canadian to go out and catch 10 flies a day and kill them. Catch 10 flies. That's all you have to do. Go out and catch 10 flies every day because we have climate change and this is a major problem. And you have you can help do your part. And all you have to do is c catch 10 flies. And in fact, you know, maybe we can set up a thing where if you bring your 10 dead flies to the office or your 70 per week or whatever, that we can give you some kind of, you know, reward or bonus or, you know, a small amount of money or a token or whatever. So imagine that that's the situation. And so you have lots of everyday Canadians who see the flies. There are flies and they start trying to catch flies and they start to to 10 flies a day. That's all they have to do. And maybe there's some kind of a financial reward system set up. Maybe there's not, but they're trying to do their part in any case. So psychologically, what happens to those people? Well, what, what happens is they're doing their part. There's a collective need for, for the state of Canada. They're helping, they're doing what they have to do. And they get more and more committed to this activity and what it means. And what it means is that we're helping Canada solve the problem of climate change and the effects of climate change for the Canadian people that we feel every day, which is that these flies are proliferating. They're getting on our, our food. They're hard to keep out of the restaurants or whatever it happens to be. This sounds like a pretty stupid example, but this is how totalitarianism works in practice. It's not often large campaigns like Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward, which killed anywhere between 20 and 100 million people, depending on how the estimates run. And nobody knows the real numbers because they lied and covered it all up. But this is how totalitarianism works. It asks you to do small things like respect people's pronouns or catch 10 flies. Now, I gave this silly example of 10 flies because that was actually a campaign mm -hmm. that Mao Zedong put forth in China. It was one of the things mm -hmm. Mao actually did with his people is he had them catch 10 flies per day for the help of China, which was overrun with pests. He also had them chase birds at another point and killed off a lot of birds. And it led to a famine that killed millions of people because the birds were eating the bugs that were uh, that the next year because so many birds were killed. The, the bugs weren't there or the, sorry, the birds weren't there. So the bugs proliferated and they destroyed the crops and some two or three million people starved. That was in the 1970s. You can look this up. This actually happened. So there was a campaign to catch flies. There was later a campaign to kill the non-native birds of China. These are the kinds of things these totalitarians do, partly because it builds commitment. But with the example of the flies, if Justin Trudeau came out and linked that to climate change, it creates an inextricable link in your mind that you have to do your part to fight climate change. And it's a stupid thing. So you're now you're more and more committed because you're, why am I catching flies? Why am I going around looking for flies to catch? I don't see that many in my house. So now I'm out looking for flies so I can find 10 per day. I'm setting traps. I'm putting things out to draw flies to the house so I can catch them. Why am I doing this? Oh, yeah, because we have to stop climate change. And you become ideologically committed. In fact, Mal called this technique uh, ideological remolding uh, or ideological transformation. And uh, it sometimes gets translated as thought reform or brainwashing. And these kinds of techniques are actually how totalitarianism is practiced. So if the government starts mandating that you respect the pronouns of people who demand that they have their pronouns respected, even though those pronouns are either they're one of two things. One, they are out of step with reality if they don't match the person uh, in their their sex or two, they're superfluous. The number of people on the planet who would have to actually specify their pronouns as an adult to, for people to know which sex they are is a very small number. And that's unfortunate that they, that, that, that they will deal with that, you know, as it's called misgendering sometimes in their lives. 
There are zero people. Like if I went up to somebody and they said, what are your pronouns? I said, guess. I'm almost positive you'll get them right. They know what I am. They know what pronouns go with that. There's, this isn't in question for such an overwhelming proportion of the population that one of two things is happening when you're being asked to participate in the pronoun game. Either you're being asked to affirm something false or you're being asked to participate in something unnecessary. Both of these things are ultimately humiliating. The person that is forced to participate in this ritual is not being kind or empathetic. They're they're humili- humiliating themselves. They're either lying and being compelled to lie and giving in to the lie in order to be nice. I think the colloquial term for for lying to fit in is selling a piece of your soul. Or they are participating in a bogus ritual that everybody knows is bogus for some symbolic purpose. In both cases, you are uh, actually humiliating the person involved. Now, if you read Theodore, Theodore Dalrymple about communism, uh, and he's a wonderful source to read about communism, he said that he finally realized after years and years and years of studying communist propaganda or totalist propaganda that its point isn't just to mislead. And in fact, its point is often not to mislead. It is to humiliate. It's to get people to, mm. to participate in small lies and give pieces of themselves away over time so that they mm. no longer have the ability to trust themselves to know what's true, that they no longer have the confidence to believe in themselves because they're constantly participating in these small lies. So to ask somebody to do the pronoun thing is almost no different. And in fact, in some ways, far more insidious than asking them to go catch 10 flies to stop climate change. Wow, that's an amazing explanation with things like pronouns, flying a pride flag, whatever whatever it is, taking the knee, all these sort of gestures that are increasingly demanded of us. So can we briefly link, so I, so I think our viewers and listeners will be getting how that, uh, you're arguing that that's part of the totalitarian system. How does that lead to the, to the billions? Because I imagine, you know, people just push back and say, uh, you, you probably... Either this sounds like a conspiracy theory or something sure. like that. So do you want to make that extra link? Yeah, for so us? I'll talk about Mao, where we know that historically it is not in question that somewhere between 20 and 100 million people died in the Great Leap Forward. That's one specific period of time, by the way, that lasted about three years. Um, and then I'll talk about what is happening here and why it poses a similar risk. So with Mao, I don't know why I ha- all this study of communism, you think I would have figured this out by now. I don't know why, but they love five-year plans. They always have five-year plans. It's always a five-year plan to do this, a five-year plan to do that. So Mao took power. A lot of people don't know the history very well. He took power the first time in 1949, and he initiated his first five-year plan. And it turns out Mao's first five-year plan of building socialism was pretty successful. He got a lot of the backwards areas more organized. He got the ability to distribute resources. It wasn't pleasant. It was still a dictator uh, that had just won a military coup and a lot of fractured, damaged population. But the first five-year plan was actually fairly successful. And so coming into 1954 or thereabouts, he launches his second five-year plan. And it turns out that that was aimed at increasing um, the efficiency and success of industrial production and food production in China, uh, as well as deepening the commitment to, uh, to socialism. And it was actually even more successful, it turns out. And you can, you know, he has these speeches he wrote in 57 and 58 bragging about how successfully it was going. And the history books actually show that when you're, and this is why communism is so popular at at first in peasant societies very frequently, like Russian peasants took it up being promised bread and land. And that's basically, I think it was probably rice and land, but that's more or less what they were promised in China as well. And it's very successful. And so we come to the middle, the end part, roughly, of Mao's second five-year plan. And things have actually improved for the peasantry. I mean, it's not a good situation. Everybody's being brainwashed. There is, There are purges going on. There is totalitarianism. It's not a great system, but economic conditions are actually improving mm. in China for many of the people. Uh, so, and on, the, on paper, it, it looks pretty fairly successful. So he launches his third five-year plan. He announces that he's going to do it in 57 and 58. We're going to have our third five-year plan, and that's called the Great Leap Forward. And that's where Mao decided to get out ahead of his skis, because the thing is that communism ultimately doesn't work. Um, It demands things of people that are not real, that they can't do. And then when it doesn't work, it 
externalizes the blame onto the people. Communism can't be wrong. It has to be that the people weren't sufficiently committed to it, or they had the wrong attitudes or the wrong values, or there were selfish people or spies or interlopers that were undermining it. And so the third great, the third uh, five-year plan, the Great Leap Forward, was was to take China to the number one producer of steel and grain in the world. But he was so infused in his communist ideology at this point, and he had so few people disagreeing with him because of the previous thing that happened that was called the Hundred Flowers Campaign, uh, where he purged the entire society of people who disagreed with him. He said, let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. So everybody has free speech. Tell us what's wrong with the government. And then about, I don't know, nine months into this process where people were telling them all the things that, he, that they don't like about the totalitarian government, he, he started something he called the anti-right wing campaign or the anti-rightist campaign. And he went after all the people who spoke up against the government and purged them, put them in prison or killed them. And so as it turns out, he had no, no, nobody trying to reel him in anymore. And so now he started to say that the peasants who are the farmers have to learn to make steel so that everybody can go along. He started melting plows. He started melting farm equipment. Nobody knew how to make steel out in the countryside. So they were making pig iron that's worthless. Uh, meanwhile, he had the people coming that actually were the steel workers and the army. And he had them going out and doing farming and bullying the local farmers to do land reform. And the whole thing just collapsed. And it turns out, there was one bad winter involved. There was a bad winter that hit, but with the combination of the bad planning and the bad winter and being too out over his skis, the whole thing fell in the dump and literally over, over 20 million, but probably a hundred million people died or killed or were starved um, as a result of the collapse. The collapse in the Great Leap Forward was so bad that even though Mao was the dictator of a communist country, they made him step down in 1962. He regained power with the Cultural Revolution in 66. That's another story. So the reason that it led to hundreds of millions of deaths or tens of millions of deaths, at least in Soviet Union and in in uh, China, also in Cambodia and so on, is because mm. it doesn't work. And when it starts to fail, they blame the people that are that that they cl call the enemies of the people. They, bl they blame their class enemies and they start turning the people against and the government and the the people against their class enemies and the mass murders purges um a lot of forced labor that forces people to work until they die all have to come into play to try to force this thing to work that's not going to work uh so the unrealistic expectations and uh, underlying ideology of communism eventually lead to force and people die what's going to happen here in the West is a little bit mm. different. Mm. Two things are, are happening at once that threaten very large numbers of lives. We have advanced economies. I don't know if you, maybe you're an outdoorsy kind of guy. Maybe you know how to go out and catch a rabbit and skin it and cook it and eat it. Most people don't. Most people cut off from the supermarket and the grid are not going to make it very long. They just, they don't have the capabilities. There are too many of us. If all of us knew how to go out and catch rabbits, we're going to run out of rabbits very quickly. Also, rabbits aren't sufficient to sustain us. Uh, as some people would understand. But the point stands. Well, there are too many of us. We need advanced agriculture. We need advanced food distribution. We need water distribution. We have lots of things that we, re we require to sustain the populations that we have. That's a big problem if you start, say, the diversity hiring problem. If you start creating an institutional pressure that pushes out people with the institutional knowledge to make those industries work, and start bringing in people for ideological reasons uh, or for other reasons that aren't competent to do the work or aren't interested in doing the work or want to do activism or communism as, through their workplace instead of doing the job. The institutional knowledge collapse I'm hearing in multiple sectors, energy, farming, aviation is, is a policing, military is a looming crisis throughout the West largely but not entirely based off of two forces one of those forces is the dei hiring another of those forces is in fact that the overwhelming majority of the potential talent pool who would have been mechanics machinists electricians and so on tradesmen went to college instead and now they work in low-level management positions uh pushing paper and they have a college degree so it's not like they're about to go become a welder they're too good for it now. Mm. And so you have this bottoming out of the talent pool for the trades mm. 
but the trades are what actually make society work. So that's one problem. When the when these grids or food systems or, or water systems collapse, people will die in large numbers. And you think, well, they won't want that to happen, but they actually, I don't know if they want the people to die, but they do want these collapses to happen because the model that they're pushing in the West is called degrowth communism or just degrowth. This, look it up, the word's everywhere. Degrowth, the symbol for degrowth is literally a circle at the bottom of a, of a, of a well or a drain. So it's your society going down the drain to what they call a circular economy in the middle where they have all the parameters balanced perfectly and all the inputs become outputs and the outputs become the new inputs. And it's a perfectly waste-free economy. This is the, the, the vision. But the right name for degrowth is degrowth communism. You can read the books for about it. For example, there's one that's very popular right now called Slow Down or Slowing Down by Kohei Saito, which is a kind of user, uh, it's kind of a popular audience summary of his longer book, which is called Marx and the Anthropocene, toward an idea of degrowth communism, where they explain that what we need to do is to degrow Western economies. The Western economies are not sustainable, so we need to generate less energy. Well, we see that happening. They're turning off our power plants and replacing them with windmills that don't work when they freeze. We need to um, degrow our food supply. This is why the farmers are revolting across Europe. This isn't a huge, difficult question to answer. Uh, we need to degrow the amount of uh, amount of land that we use for economic production. This is the United Nations agenda that's called 30 by 30. 30% 30 of the usable lands of the world have to be freed up by 2030 that made unproductive, brought back to nature. And so these are models that are designed around the idea of degrowth, which says that we're going to have greater abundance by degrowing and not focusing on GDP or quality of life as measures of economic success. They explicitly ask us to lower our expectations for quality of life for the cause so that we can save the planet or what they actually say is have greater abundance um, abundance of what? Abundance of free time, abundance of family, abundance of natural sunsets and natural environments that are nice to look at, abundance of you know fish being fish in the ocean, not because we're overfishing them necessarily, but just for the fish being fish. And these things create a bigger picture of abundance than what is called commodity abundance. They say that capitalism produces a large amount of commodity abundance. But we forget all the other kinds of wealth and abundance that we could share in common through a commonwealth where we distribute the benefits of those things more fairly and equitably. And this is actually the model. Well, let me tell you a secret. And this is why billions are going to die. And it's very, very simple. There is no such thing as a society that has a high standard of living and low energy production. The overwhelming variable that determines quality of life, standard of living, ability to solve problems, ability to mitigate disasters or injuries when something happens, it, the overwhelming variable is capacity to produce energy. It's energy abundance. Energy abundance is wealth abundance. There is no such thing as a flourishing society that can't produce sufficient energy. Energy production, therefore, is a strong proxy for GDP. You can actually see this on, on, on virtually any chart that you look at about the two. And they want to cut those things back. They want to shrink GDP. They want to shrink energy production. They want to shrink food production. What are you going to eat? They tell you to get used to less. There actually are reports, for example, from an organization there in the UK called UK Fires, F-I-R-E-S, Fires, like burning a fire. Mm -hmm. That's in collaboration with the British government, with Oxford, with Cambridge, with all the big universities. And they put in a, a, a document in 2019 called Absolute Zero, saying that net zero is not enough. We have to go to absolute zero. Absolute zero carbon mm -hmm. emissions by 2050. What does absolute zero carbon emissions by 2050 look like? Well, it means no container shipping, no heavy rail, no uh, cruise ships, no plane travel whatsoever. Everything is light rail maximum. No new steel production anywhere. All steel is recycled. No new cement production anywhere in the world. This is the model that they're pushing. And what do they advise you to do, say, to stay warm in the winter? They say start buying heavier clothing and blankets now. There's so much there, and thank you so much for it. I guess someone might come back at you and say, yes, but but the pendulum will swing before it gets really bad. I'm sure you hear this all the time. So take the situation with American Airlines at the moment. 
there's all, all these examples coming out about perhaps some people who aren't the best um, qualified for the job are getting into the pilot positions and people are freaking out. All right. Because it's, it's one thing having that in, you know, uh, in academia, if people um, who aren't most qualified are getting the jobs, but <laughs> in your, in the, as a pilot, you need your pilot yeah, to know or what air traffic doing. controllers. And so, so, so the argument will just be, no, no, people will, the pendulum will swing before, because I hear what you're saying. If, if, if all the really competent people in the areas that we really need competence, if they sort of disappear, then we're screwed. And I, I can actually hear that. And it's very, it's rare that people actually make that link from where we are now to how things could get bad. I can see that. And thank you for that. But people will just say, nah, nah, we'll all revolt. The pendulum will swing. People will go mental and we won't let it happen. I know I, I, I said I wouldn't keep you past 40 minutes. We're no, already no, no, on 50. So briefly, uh, how, like, like, how do you respond to no, that? No, it's easy. Like, we'll, um, we'll revolt. Okay, so you revolt. Does that produce an electrician? Does that produce a machinist? Does that produce a competent air traffic controller? Like the the problem of the, the institutional knowledge, as they call it, death, is really a scary one. It's a true time bomb for society. You can revolt all you want. How are you going to produce people who know how to build nuclear power plants? That's already a problem, by the way. They don't know how to – some of the reason we're not building nuclear power plants at the same rates – that we were at one point is this kind of pressure through ESG initiatives and whatever. But part of it's that actually they don't know how the people, the engineers who knew how to build them have retired or died. They don't know how think of how many people they squeezed out of skilled professions because they refused to get the COVID vax. Those people didn't mm. stop their lives. They didn't go home and sit in their armchair and wait to get called back. They went and got other jobs or they decided to retire if depending on their age or some of them died because of their age. Those people were the ones who would have mentored the young people coming in to teach them how to do the job right. You know, we all know there's the book and then there's how you really do it. Well, that mm. institutional knowledge is lacking. You turn off a, a fuel refinery, say in Louisiana, they shut down some fuel refineries, let's say four or five years down the road. You don't have people who can turn the thing back on. They don't know how. That's a 15 to 20 mm. year education engineering problem to start to solve just to turn the thing back on that was running just fine before that collapse happened. So that's a true problem. That is a, having a revolt is great if you want to stop the politics, I guess, but it doesn't solve the institutional knowledge problem that is remaining as a time bomb. You would have to have a massive campaign into the trades, um, which would have to end up, you know, earning the people to get involved, a lot of prestige and a lot of money to get them involved. But there's another problem here, which is the revolt itself. What does that revolt look like? Does it, is it a revolt back to uh, free enterprise? Is it re a revolt back to classical liberal values that allowed us to build these things in the first place? Is it, is it a revolt back to that? Or do we go to another kind of tyrant? History has taught that under these pressures, mm -hmm. typically that communism gives way, if communist provocation gives way to fascist tyranny, which then gets subverted by the left and you end up with um, a third world country, basically, uh, the revolt itself and the people that are orchestrating these things like degrowth communism and pressuring degrowth are aware that a revolt is likely to come and that maybe it's not even the best option to try to suppress it, but rather to co-opt it, to push it, to go too far, to create the government that gives you a year or two of what feels like breathing room only to come around and have the, the the force of that government, the totalitarian government on the right, turning left over time. And history has taught that this virtually always happens. Uh, not that the totalitarian system works great anyway. Everybody credits Franco and Spain for saving Frank, uh, Spain from the communists. And that part might actually be true. And that he was starting to do things that protected Spain and grew Spain. And for the first, you know, 10 years or so of his reign from the 1930s going into 19. 40s, roughly when, you know, he was kissing Hitler's ass so that he didn't fall on the wrong side of Axis. And then all of a sudden it looked like the Allies were going to win. And he flipped over immediately, such a principled guy, and started kissing Allied ass so that nobody would come come get him. Uh, after that, Spain's economy, Franco stayed in power till 75. Fr Spain's economy started to just get worse and worse and worse. It worked out great at first and then it got bad. 
And it kind of decimated it to the point where even in the 80s, you could go to Spain uh, and, you know, be outside of Madrid or Barcelona, not too far outside of the city. And you got people with cars and you also have people like literally with donkey carts, you know, trying to bring their goods and things around it on the outskirts of the city. It was it completely decimated it. Uh, so it turns out that totalitarians tend not to rule very well over time. Uh, but it, the point here is that we can revolt, but we're not solving the institutional problem that way. We have to ask ourselves, what are we revolting for? Are we revolting for liberty or are we revolting for power and revenge? We will be pushed mm. to revolt for power and revenge. And if we take as a, to, to pull a metaphor from from your your island, if we take the ring of power and wield it for ourselves, it will corrupt everything we make with it. So, yeah, maybe we defeat Sauron and we become mm. a new dark lord on the on the throne ourselves. Uh, and that will be corrupted to evil. In other words, if, if we are provoked into wanting power and might and force and revenge rather than liberty, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a system that history has repeatedly told us is going to get subverted by the left, conquered by the left, and that might do incalculable damage in the meantime, because we will have sacrificed our liberties for a small amount of security. And as Benjamin Franklin said, I know you guys don't like our revolutionary heroes here, but as Benjamin Franklin said, anyone who would do that deserves neither. Wasn't it Solzhenitsyn who said, uh, you know, the people say it will never happen here. It just can't happen here in Russia. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting, you know, I'm sure there's there's a lot of that with people saying this will never happen here in the West. Are you pessimistic then for the next sort of 10, 10 years? Um, that's a funny word. I'm optimistic. I actually mm. think I'm, I'm very scared for, for the UK and for Europe, honestly. The UK most, I believe, more than – well, actually, UK and Germany most uh, over on your side of the ocean. Um, they Germany has – broken itself and it's it's starting to show uh the uk has an immigration issue and sets of laws that make it very difficult to sort out um i think some of the other european countries will have a slightly better uh prospect with that although i don't know what sweden will do i think that this decade is going to be very rough but i'm ultimately optimistic that enough people have woken up to especially on the north american continent to push this back i see tremendous energy Tremendous momentum building in the United States and in Canada both. Uh, so I'm actually pretty optimistic. I don't think that we're going to have a comfortable decade. And I think that many of the, you know, to draw the Tolkien metaphor again, many fair things shall fade in the process. But, and we'll have to dedicate ourselves to learning to rebuild many of those high quality of life, high trust society benefits that we had formerly. But I'm ultimately optimistic. I do think this decade, in particular this year and next, will be um, very rough years. Uh, in in mm. many ways, I'm not entirely okay. sure what that looks like, though. So, just to clarify, because we talked about revolt, so you're saying revolt, no, but but there is sort of a there is a possibility of, of like a counter revolutionary movement that's that's getting steam. Yes, a, a we counter revolution pointed toward restoring the liberty of the people, uh, and you know, kind of the, uh, there is an element that's almost a little bit got a taste of that chauvinism that the revolt would want. And that is that, you know, British people should be able to proclaim British values <laughs> and American people should be able to proclaim mm. American values mm. and Canadian people. Like one of the things that they've made us apologize for and, and step away from uh, in schools in particular, they think that, Oh, well you, we need a more multicultural educational program. So it's, it would be shameful if your school in Britain taught British history and values. It's got to open up to other values. It's got to, and what, what's happened at least in the U S is that this has turned into a very negative portrayal of United States history and U S uh, customs mm -hmm. and values and a very positive portrayal of virtually all the others. And we've all been so, so apologetic. I think that we're going to realize that no, 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 we, we can, we can advocate on behalf of the cultures that we've built over you know, the centuries, we have a couple, you guys have many more uh, behind you without having lost the ability to do um, something that, you know, we think we're doing that we call inclusion. So what do I mean by that? I don't believe in multiculturalism because I believe multiculturalism is a, is a fragmenting wedge driving program. But I see that the way that human, coming from America, which is a very pluralistic society and truly a very diverse society, allegedly a nation of immigrants, 
what I see here and have seen here is that there are kind of values within society stack on two levels. There are kind of core values and then there are more superficial values. And the American experiment actually says we're going to agree upon the core values of Americanism. And then if you want to do whatever country you're from, whatever religion you have, if you want to practice those values under an umbrella of American, that's great. So if you want to say you're an Ethiopian immigrant and you come over and you want to have an Ethiopian neighborhood and you want to have an Ethiopian food and you want to have an Ethiopian party and you want to bring Ethiopian culture and ideas to America, we want those things. So it sounds very inclusive. But the thing is, is you're also going to be an American and you're going to be an American first. You're going to not say that it's uh, unacceptable to be American. You're going to not say that it's unacceptable to um, espouse values contrary to your your you know, your country's of origins values. And so we have this sort of, uh, the, I think societies operate when their core values align. And that's what we should be looking for. The superficial values bring diversity. And I think that this diversity inclusion argument that we're being fed by woke Marxists confuses those two aspects. They want us to change our core values rather than admitting the superficial values. And Mm. I think that that's literally, I think, how societies are organized. So I don't think I'm making something up or asking people uh, to do something that's unnatural. But I think there will have to be a little bit of that. Like British people say, if you want to be in Britain, you're going to be British. And if you're going to if you want to be in the United States, you're going to be American and tough. If you don't like it, there's other places. Mm. Mm. James, Lindsay, you've been so generous with your time. We've gone 20 minutes over. We hugely appreciate that. So the, your message is that there's a revolution going on. It's it's linked to sort of the, the, the revolutions that we saw in the 20th century. Um, different guys, but it's linked. And things could get really bad, but there is hope in the form of counter-revolution. Now, we, we simply don't have time to go into what that looks like. Uh, so we were both at the ARC forum um, a couple of months ago, and I guess quite a lot of people there were trying to, to gather and, and talk about what could be done. But that's your message. James, thank you so much for joining us. To our viewers and liter- listeners, let us know in the comments what you think. It's a, it's a bold um, thesis. And it's one that we've considered uh, at times over the last uh, couple of months in creating culture. So, James, thank you. And uh, to our viewers and listeners, see you soon. Yeah, I appreciate you.